Matthew chapter 28, Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Here at Austin Oaks, we want to be the movement that sees Austin saturated with the gospel by developing disciples so that the emerging generations will be captivated by Jesus Christ. Good morning, church. Yeah, there's a little bit of energy in there. Good morning. It's great to see you here this morning. My name is Chad McCartney. If you're new with us, I'm one of the pastors here at Austin Oaks Church. I oversee discipleship and groups and various things like that and, and really love to see and help you get connected into a smaller community within our larger community. Uh, if you're new again, we're in the midst of a series we titled Be the Movement or We Are This Movement. And we've been walking through the Gospel of Luke. So if you're entering at this journey, we're towards the end of this particular gospel, and we're coming into the climax of it, of Jesus on his journey to the cross, and we're going to witness that today as we dive into it. And then we'll continue into the book of Acts, which is the second volume of Luke's writings. He wrote the gospel that talks about the life of Jesus, and then the book of Acts talks about the church and what happened after Jesus rose and and left and commissioned his disciples to continue his message, And, and that's what we'll be moving into after this and into next year. So it's a perfect kind of uh, combination of those two things, of understanding where the, the Christian faith comes from and what happened. So Uh, As we do this, I just want to give you a little heads up today. Uh, The message and the the structure is going to be slightly different, so just don't let that throw you off. It's not a big deal, but I'm going to walk through two sections in this passage and then have us respond to each of them. So the first one is we're going to walk through the first half where where really what you're going to see is Jesus on this journey to the cross. And in this journey, he's going to interact with all different groups of people. And the, and the author of this gospel, Luke, wants you to see yourself in the story. That's how the gospel writers are often writing. And so it's putting yourself in the midst of a story. And we're going to see in the midst of the story uh, three improper responses when people don't see Jesus properly. And we're going to see one proper response and what happens when you do see him uh, properly. So we're going to look at the improper responses. And then we're going to pause and Dalton's going to come up and we're going to sing a song and we're going to have a time of reflection because all of us will see ourselves in those people. And it's very important that we can identify where we're not seeing Jesus properly. And that's what the gospel is all about, seeing Jesus properly. And then I'll come back, we'll we'll share briefly about the one person that sees him properly and, and how that impacts us going forward. So if you have a Bible with you, Luke chapter 23 is where we're going to be. We're going to start in verse 26 and just kind of walk through this crucifixion scene, this very powerful scene in these last moments of Jesus' life. The passage will come up on the screens as well. If you don't have a Bible with you and you want to follow along, you can see them there. Let me pray and we'll jump in. Father God, we love you and just thank you so much for the joy we have in gathering as your people, for the privilege we have in opening up your word together um, and the truths that it reveals to us, Lord. Uh, My prayer is ultimately that the Spirit will work in each of our hearts to open our eyes to the beauty, the majesty, and the glory and goodness of who Jesus is. We are at the pinnacle of this story, Lord. May we see everything that you intended for us to see about your son. And Lord Jesus, may you be honored, may you be desired and and greatly loved and, and just inflame our hearts with a joy and an absolute majesty over who you are. And ask this in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, it's been so nice 
uh, over the months to see little by little uh, people trickling back in and as things are slowly opening up and, get, and getting a little safer for some. I know it's not for all, but seeing more and more faces and welcoming them back. But there's been two people that, that haven't been present uh, the whole COVID time. And they, they're making their first appearance back today. And I'm super excited to, to have them again. Their names are Sven and Oli. Yeah, do you remember Sven and Oli? Yeah, I know. They're, they are back. They're here today. And they've been locked up this whole COVID time for good reason. But they're back today. And so, so if you don't know Sven and Oli, if you're new, there's, there's some history behind Sven and Oli that, that connects not only to our church, but to me personally. Sven and Oli are, are Scandinavians, right? And I grew up in Minnesota, all Scandinavian. I married a Scandinavian woman. Johnson is her last name. They did like lutefisk. They tried it every single way you could, even in the dishwasher. It still stunk up the house. That's just, it's part of our culture. So uh, this church, as you know, the Evangelical Free Church has Scandinavian roots as well. It comes out of the Scandinavian Lutheran church and, and this movement. So there's this history here. So Sven and Oli are just characters that, you know, every culture has that you kind of tell jokes about, right? It's just the common names you do. So, so this is a Sven and Oli joke, okay? So, so Sven wakes up in the middle of the night, midnight, one o'clock, whatever, and he's freaking out because he thinks he's dying, I mean, he's just panicked. So he calls Oli, calls Oli and wakes him up, and Oli's just upset. He goes, Sven, what is it? What's wrong? What's wrong? He says, Oli, I'm dying. I'm dying. I think I'm dying. He says, well, well, what's wrong? Just calm down. Tell me what's happening, Sven. He goes, why do you think you're dying? He says, well, like I touched my leg and it hurts. I touched my, my hip and it hurts. I touched my stomach and it hurts. I touched my head and it hurts. Everything I touch, it hurts. I got to be dying. You got to get over here. Get me to the hospital as fast as you can. So Oli, being the good friend that he is, you know, drives over, picks up Sven, and takes him to the emergency room. And the doctors rush him in, and they're, you know, as he's explaining to them all that's going on, they get him a CAT scan, they get him an MRI, they do blood work, they do every single test they can to figure out what is going on with Sven. And finally, they get him into the doctor's office, and the doctor's talking to him and telling him, and he says, he says Sven, well, he says, I have some good news for you, and I have some bad news. And Sven goes, well, why don't you start with the good news because I don't know that I'm going to be around long enough to hear the bad news. <laughs> the doctor says, well, the good news is, Sven, you're not dying. He goes, really? I'm not dying? He goes, yeah, that's the good news. You're not dying. You, know, you, hurt, you think you're hurt everywhere, but you're not dying. He says, what's the bad news, doc? He says, the bad news is you have a broken finger. <laughs> get it? It hurts everywhere. Yeah. Some of you will get it on your way to lunch today. But, but there is, I know I'm just an all-around funny guy. I know people tell me this all the time, but there, there, there actually is a point to that story today. And here it is. Perspective makes all the difference in life. And when you have a wrong perspective, things that maybe seem like they have nothing to do with it will seem like they're falling apart. And you'll try to fix what's falling apart when it's your perspective that's the issue. Some of you here, you come here and you come with major financial issues, financial burdens, and you've struggled with them on and on, and you keep trying to fix your finances, and you keep trying to find a better credit card deal, or you're you know, working with getting a raise at work or finding that right job. If you could just make more money, you think, if you could just get more money, get that deal, get that quick fix on this, then your financial problems will go to get, all go away. But it's your perspective and not having a proper perspective on finances that's causing all your problems, and until you recognize that, they'll never go away. Some of you are in relationships or want to be in a relationship either way, and you think everything else is wrong with the relationship. If I just switched partners, man, if I had a better partner, man, my relationship would be so much better. Man, if, if people really saw the qualities in me, like I'd, I'd be dating material. I'm dating material. Come on, look at this. This is the whole package right here. That's what you're thinking, right? And, and it's a perspective. You can't find that proper perspective that's helping you see your relationships in the right way. Some of you, it's in the mental health area. I shared with you a few months ago my journey with mental health and, and how I'm still working through and dealing with those kinds of things. And, and one of the things I've learned in that, even though there's a well-rounded approach to it, that a good 
majority of mental health, even if it's a physical thing, relates to perspective. And a wrong perspective, whether you get treatment for it or not, will always leave you in an unhealthy spot if you don't first address your perspective. It's just how life works. And as we walk on this journey to the cross today, you're gonna see the exact same thing. And it's more important than your finances. It's more important than any other relationship you've ever been in. It's more important than any level of mental health that you may want to experience. It's your perspective on who Jesus is. And if it's wrong, your life is gonna be filled with a lot of harm. And if it's correct, you'll experience a transformation in your life that will change you and your circumstances for all of eternity. So if you have your Bible with you, like I said, Luke chapter 23, we're going to look at 26 through uh, about 43, and I want you to see uh, a couple things here. I want you to see first, in this first section that we're going to talk about, is three ways an improper view of Jesus' resurrection will harm you. Three ways, and I'm not making these up. I, I know you probably think, man, he made up half of what he spoke that last time. I'm really not making this up, okay? I'm just, I'm just showing you what's right here. I tell people this all the time. If people knew that my whole job is plagiarism of other people's great ideas, they'd never pay me to do what I'm doing. But don't, tell, don't let that leave this room, okay? I'm just telling you what the Bible says, okay? You have to make a decision on what you want to do with it. So three ways an improper view of Jesus' crucifixion will harm you. That's what I want to spend this first half, the majority of it on. The last part, we're going to look at two ways that a proper view will absolutely transform you. Improper view will harm you. Proper view transform you. So look with me, in, in verse, starting in verse 26 of chapter 23. It says, as they led Jesus away, a man named Simon, who is from Cyrene, happened to be coming in from the countryside. The soldier seized him and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. Now let me just pause here because this isn't even part of the message, but it's so true of the Bible and it's all through the Bible and it's what makes Christianity and the Bible unique amongst every single world religion. There is no other world religion that's like Christianity in this way. And this is part of why I believe this is the only true legitimate faith to put your faith in. It's because if Christianity was a legend, if it was just stories that a lot of people like to say they would, you would never put specific details like this in there. Simon from Cyrene coming in from the, the countryside. Like it, it names the guy, it tells you where he's from. He would have been there when it happened. If you go to the Gospel of Mark, it names his two sons. And, and Mark writes it as if, hey, you know Simon. Like Simon, this is his son, Rufus and, and Alexander. Right? Like, you would never do that unless you were writing to people that said, oh yeah, I know Simon. Because if you were writing a legend, if you were making this up, you would not want to put in details where someone could go, I'm going to go talk to Simon and see if that really happened. Oh, that's him with the sons? I can identify him? You could track down the truth and you could invalidate it if it wasn't true. No other religion in their writings does this. It's one guru, it's just his visions or whatever it might be coming out. It is not tied to history in such a way. These gospels were written within and circulating within the time frame that all these people were living. If it was fake, if it was a joke, if it was a legend, people would have thrown it away at that point and said, hey, I talked to Simon. He never carried the cross. He didn't see this. In fact, Luke probably got a lot of this information from Simon who was carrying Jesus' cross and probably witnessed these conversations. In fact, I'd be willing to bet that Simon probably wasn't a believer and became a believer like we're going to see someone else in the story as he witnessed this Jesus on this journey. And he was part of that community and was able to share his story of what happened. That's just my thought. That's the Bible right there. That's just my thought. You can take that or leave it, all right? So it says, a large crowd trailed behind him, including many grief-stricken women. 
So in, in Israel, a lot of times they would hire people in the Jerusalem or the Jewish culture to, to be mourners, professional mourners, and they'd wail and they'd kind of bring that kind of element. Some of these were probably legitimate people mourning, but they were following alongside, and it says here in verse 28, Jesus turned to them and said, daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are coming when they will say, fortunate indeed are the women who are childless, the wombs that have not borne a child, and the breasts that have never nursed. Now I need you to pause for a moment and think about the power of that statement in their culture. It doesn't seem like as big a deal in our culture when, when women are more career-oriented and family isn't as big a deal nowadays. Back then, for a woman to be childless was about the greatest shame that society could put on them. And Jesus is saying, those will be the people who will be the most fortunate. That's what he's predicting or saying about in this passage. He says, people will beg the mountains, fall on us and plead with the hills, bury us. For if these things are done when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other criminals, two others, both criminals were led out to be executed with them. And when they came to a place called the skull, they nailed him to the cross and the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. The crowd watched and the leaders scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he's really God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers mocked him too by offering him a drink of sour wine. They called out to him, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. A sign was fastened above him with these words, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. So here's why I want to pause. I want to look at that and say, uh, what does it look like when we don't see Jesus properly? From these women and the crowd walking behind him to this criminal right next to him that's witnessing all this. What does it look like when we don't properly see Jesus? Well, the first thing is when I don't properly see Jesus, I'll wrongly grieve for Jesus by thinking I'm okay and he isn't. That's the first thing. That's just, I'm just putting what Jesus said in modern words. These women are there grieving, they're mourning for Jesus on his walk to the death. And, and what that reveals about them is they think that they're better off than Jesus, that they're okay. We're okay. It's Jesus we need to mourn for in this moment. And Jesus gently but firmly rebukes them for their lack of perspective. You see, you can't properly grieve Jesus. It's not to say that there shouldn't have been any mourning or grief over what he did or what he's done. But you can't properly grieve for Jesus until you properly see yourself in light of the scope and depth of coming judgment. Until you recognize why he went to the cross. And what that means for you and I, you will never be able to properly grieve for Jesus. You see, if you grieve for Jesus more than you grieve for the coming judgment and its scope and what it'll mean to people, then you lack a perspective of scale. What do you mean by that, Chad? I mean, I mean this. It would be no different than this. If you were freaking out and calling the police and frantically sweeping your floors because your kids walked into the house and they tracked a little bit of mud in and you're calling the EMS and fire and you're sweeping away, sweeping away, get this mud out, get this mud out, oh my goodness, I can't believe you tracked this in. And right behind them, there's a murderer and a rapist whom you're doing nothing about walking right into the home. That's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, don't you worry about the, the dirt on the floor, so to speak, this little bit, when what's coming is infinitely worse for you than what you're going to witness today. It's improper grief. It's an improper perspective on death and what that looks like for us. 
My wife and I, this sound, may sound strange, but, but we talk about death all the time of us dying. When I, like, here's the, frequently how it goes. Man, when I die, just like, let me go. I'm ready to run. I'm running to Jesus. Let me go. Now, it sounds a little morbid, but th- there's actually some perspective in that. Like, like, we have this tendency to think life is so great here. We have got to hang on as long as we possibly could because otherwise we've got to go, go be with Jesus. Like, that's just a warped. Like, when we mourn as Christians, Paul says this to Christians, don't grieve for those who die. Like, they have a better, you mourn with the different than the world mourns. You grieve for those who have lost someone, you grieve for them, but you don't grieve for that person that's dying. If they're a believer, they're infinitely better off. We're ready to go. I'm ready to go. Now, I'd like to, to take care of my kids. I got responsibilities. I don't want to leave her by himself, herself. But, but I, just to be honest with you, like she knew when she married me, she was never going to have a lot of money. That was, that was off the table. Hey, you're not marrying me for money, and I have proved that right after 31 years. <laughs> I'm faithful. It's nothing else. But I, well, I, I'm not stupid enough to know with five kids and we were living in different spots and so forth, I, the last thing I wanted was her left. I didn't want to be with my kids half the time. I'm kidding. They're, they're tough at times, right? I certainly didn't want to leave her with five kids. So I was smart enough, this is one thing, you, to buy a term life policy. You know what those are? They're really cheap life insurance policies when you're young. that You can get a lot of money if you die, but you usually get rid of it before you die. So they just take your money the whole time is really what it is. But I did that. And the joke was, you know, honey, I'm worth more to you dead than I am alive. She knows that. That's how I know she loves me, is is I'm still around. And and trust me, we've had some conversations and disagreements where where I've looked in her eyes in the middle of of a pretty intense fight, and I can see her remodeling the kitchen. And that's when I know I gotta back off. This is a lose-lose preposition, okay? The, the point is this. We mourn for death, and we forget that the greater death, this judgment is coming. We cling to this life, and we think those who are heading in that direction have it worse. I'm just going to be honest with you. If, if this is, happens to be where I die here in Austin, and you come to the hospital to visit me, and I'm hooked up to, to tubes, I'm just going to, I'll give you $100 right after this service out in the foyer, if you'll come up with your Bible, step on my tube, and read Psalm 119. And when you're done, you just step back off that, and trust me, I'll be gone by that time, and I'll be way better than hanging out here. Do you see how our perspective is different? Jesus understood this. We'll wrongly grieve for Jesus by thinking that we're okay and he isn't, as he was facing death. Second thing we'll see is we'll wrongly think that Jesus is a victim. We'll wrongly think that he's a victim if we don't see this properly. Uh, He he wasn't a victim. In fact, I I remember when I was younger, I'm a pretty young guy, like maybe mid-30s. Okay, I'm not. But but when my kids were young, we had five of them. Two of them were boys, and, I, and my boys loved sports, and so we were always competing. I was always playing. When they were in elementary school, when they were in middle school, I could, like, crush them in any sport we did. I mean, just crush them. I wouldn't. I'd often let them win. I'd let them make, make shots. I wouldn't block everything they put up. I wouldn't tackle them every single time. I'd let them, you know. But you know what? What never happened when I won or when I didn't win, sorry, when I lose to them regularly if that happened, I never went into the house going to my wife, man, would you just like mourn for me because I lost again. I never wanted her to, to go, oh, Chad, I'm so sorry you lost. That was a tough loss. I never thought I was a victim because I lost again. Do you know why? Because I lost from a place of strength. I lost knowing at any moment I could have won if I wanted to. I find it fascinating, amazing actually, that Jesus, after he's been abandoned by his closest friends, he's been rejected by his own people, the Jewish people, he's been 
persecuted and rejected by his own religious leaders. He's been mistreated and unjustly trialed by his own government. I mean, the list goes on. He's been condemned. He's been beaten, as this passage tells us, beaten inches from his life. Like to the point where every other criminal, every other crucified person, they carry that cross beam up to where they're crucified. Jesus is so beaten up that he falls, he can't even carry it. It's why they had to bring Simon in to carry it. Like what else could possibly go wrong? And what does Jesus say? He's not telling people to mourn or feel sorry for himself. How can this be? Who have you ever known to display such composure, such compassion, and such absolute strength in the midst of being rejected in every human possible way you could? See, Jesus didn't go to the cross as a victim. He didn't go in weakness. No one took his life. In fact, he said these very words to his disciples just a few days prior to this in John chapter 10. If you'll bring in that passage. John chapter 10, it says, The Father loves me because I sacrificed my life so I may take it back again. Then he says this, No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily, for I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and also to take it up again, for this is what my Father has commanded me. Jesus quotes two prophetic passages of judgment in this little section. This is probably the trickiest section of this passage. These quotes of of prophetic passages, and then there's this little proverb that they would often use back in that time, and none of them really make sense to us, but this is key to understanding what's happening here. So I want to just try to explain it as simply as I can. He says here, he says, for the days are coming when they'll say, fortune are are the women who are childless, all that stuff. And then he gives us another reason. He says, people will beg the mountains, fall on us and plead with us, bury us. He's quoting these prophetic passages. One of them comes from the book of Hosea in Hosea 10, verse 8. They'll pop up here. You can see them. But let me give you the context. It's not important that we read them. He's just repeating those prophecies. Hosea was a prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel. And at that time, Israel was split into two because of their disobedience from God. They rebelled. The northern nation was the most rebellious. They never had a good king. They never followed the Lord. They did all the pagan practices that the the neighboring nations did. They sacrificed their kids on altars to their gods. They engaged in all kinds of sexual immorality in their worship. They were horrible. And Hosea was one of the prophets that was predicting their coming judgment from God against them. And in his prediction is exactly what happened. This stuff actually happened to the northern kingdom when they were sacked by Assyria from the north. This kind of stuff. And it was true. It would have been better that you didn't have kids. You would have gone through a lot better situation, as worse as it was, without having to deal with your kids going through it as well. It happened to Israel. But this passage is also stated in Revelation chapter 6. I want to read this one to you. Because in Revelation, it's now being applied to the whole world, not just the Jewish nation and what God had to do to discipline them to bring them back. This is applied to the whole world, Gentiles and Jews. He says, then everyone, the kings of the earth, the rulers, the generals, the wealthy, the powerful, and every slave and free person all hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. Next one. And they cried to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. This is the second coming of Christ and the the judgment. It says, for the great day of their wrath has come. And who is able to survive? Same exact thing. Jesus is quoting, if you knew the judgment that was coming, that, that you daughters who have rejected me, that you humanity that have rejected me and have failed to see me for who I am, if you knew what was coming, you would not 
mourn for me. You would not see me as a victim. You would shudder in your very soul at what's to come. You translate the proverb, it says, for if these things, meaning this judgment on Jesus, are done when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Like, what the heck does that mean? Don't you hate it when Jesus just throws these little statements out there that sound really profound? You go like, hmm, thanks for that one. I'm going to use that one. You know, put that up on my office wall, on the coffee mug. Try it on a coffee mug sometimes. See, it's a great conversation starter. But here's, here's another way of translating it. If these things are done to me, Jesus, the living tree, what will happen to those who are dead, who are dry, who don't have my innocence? It was a, a proverb that was all about innocence, saying, hey, if, if you ever try to burn a green log, you ever try to burn it, you put fire on it, fire was like judgment, you can burn it, but only some of it will burn. When it's all done, you'll see there's still a, a chunk of log that's left. It, the log's going to survive, but you take a dry one, and set it on fire, and the destruction is total. You get it now? It's a a pretty, like, gentle response for Jesus at that moment, isn't it? And I know what you guys are saying. I I mean, we're Austinites, right? We're modern, we're postmodern people, we're well-educated. I mean, we're so beyond this old-fashioned, Old Testament view of God being wrathful and, and justice. Like, we, we're modern people. We believe in a God of love, don't we? Like, that stuff, that was Old Testament stuff. That's old-fashioned. That's like, we're beyond that, Chad, really? I want to just challenge you for a moment. I want to challenge you that you cannot believe in a God of love that has any hope of bringing true peace and love to any place unless he is also a God of justice and wrath. So suspend your judgment for just a minute. Let me just share a simple illustration. Imperfect, but I think you'll get the point. Let's pretend you're a parent. Okay, just put yourself in the place of a parent and think of kids that you love and and care and want to protect or or anyone that you want to love and care and protect. Maybe you're not a parent. Maybe there's someone you really love and care for, okay? And they're in your house. And let's say someone comes into your house and they come in and they say, I'm going to do incredible violence to your children and to your loved one. and, And they proceed to do that horrific violence to them. And then when they're done, they come up to you and say, hey, do you mind if I join you for dinner? Because because you're a God, you're a person of love and and you should love everyone. So so you, I mean, this sounds crazy, but maybe you go, man, I I know I believe in a God of love. I I know I'm supposed to love even my enemies. So, okay, I guess I'm gonna try it. And you you let them them sit down and have dinner with you. And when they're done having dinner, they get up and they do the exact same thing to your loved one again. And they keep coming back and asking to have a meal with you and keep going back and doing the same thing. How does your God of love deal with that? He can't. Because it's not a true God. Without justice and wrath, there is no love. True love always protects first what is right and what is of value to it. And it will destroy what is wrong for the good. Now, that seems messy for us humans because we're messed up. We're so prejudiced and we're so about me that our justice and our wrath rarely accomplishes God's perfect righteousness. But If there's a true and righteous God, if there's a perfect God, could you suspend your view such that that maybe he knows who is deserving of wrath and will do it properly? If not, what hope do you ever have of anything being better than what you will ever currently experience in this broken world? Just something to think about. That's probably a message series in itself. Last thing we see in this, excuse me, is I will wrongly live as a superior to him. 
When I see Jesus improperly, I will wrongly live as a superior to him. We see this in the soldiers. We see this in those people mocking him. They're looking down at him. Save yourself if you were truly the king. They're, they're mocking of him. They're looking down on him. They think they're superior to him because they're standing out there in this place of authority, and he's up there being crucified and killed. Two things that will happen when we do this. I'll mock his way of salvation, and that's what they were doing. They were mocking Jesus' way of salvation. I'll believe that he needs to operate according to my ways and the world's ways of saving as opposed to his ways. That's what we do, and every time we mock his salvation, every time we go, that's not how you should do it, God. Every time he asks us to do something that's gonna make us look foolish in this world, we say, I I shouldn't have to do that. Like, I have dignity myself. I have, I have, I have. It's a lot of eyes usually in that. And we fall prey to this when we expect God to carry out our political agendas, our school board agendas, our HOA agendas, right? You, wanna, you want something exciting? Go to an HOA meeting sometime <laughs> and see how Christian everyone looks when they're there. Our workplace agendas, even our social justice causes. We expect God to carry them out the way we want them carried out. And when we do that, we are standing on the path mocking God and his way of salvation. Doesn't mean any of those things are wrong at all. It's just what we think we need in those moments. You see, when you spend infinite amounts of time and resources on agendas, which we do, We get caught up in agendas and we feel good about our agendas and we go after them with time, with resources. When you spend over abundant amounts of energy on agendas and you fail to share the gospel with that person who lives right next door to you that's never heard about Jesus, you are this person on the cross, on the ground, mocking Jesus' way. Because Jesus didn't try to change any of those things as his priority. But you're going to see with his last breath, he's willing to share the good news with someone hanging next to him. It was always about the kingdom first. How can I help people get into the kingdom? You can make Austin the best city in the world and everyone's still going to hell if they do not hear about the person of Jesus Christ. And that doesn't mean we should let Austin go to hell in a handbasket. And just let it be a joke and politically a mess and school's a mess. I'm not saying that. Hear me. It's just none of those things matter if it just extends a person's life or makes this time better before they face the judgment seat of Christ and have never heard about what he has done for them. Next thing we'll do is we'll put expectations on God. We, we expect him to meet our expectations when we live as a superior. Like, none of us have ever done this like the, the criminal on the cross there that says, God, save yourself. Oh, and save us while we're at it. Right, we've all had those moments when we're down on our knees and we go, okay, God, I'm in a huge jam right now. Whew. Man, if you get me out of this, I guarantee I'll be at church the, like the rest of this month, maybe two months, God. I, I might even... Don't, don't hold me to this, but I might even serve on Sunday. Whoa. Right? We've all done this. We've all bargained with God and said, just, just do this, God. And then we put our conditioned obedience on him. And every time we do that, we mock him. We hold ourselves as superior. See, when we put our expectations on God, then you're worshiping yourself. You're not worshiping him. Don't let Jesus' meek strength come across as weakness because we see it through earthly eyes. It's not. So here's what we want to do for just a few minutes. I want to pause here. I want this to sink in a little bit because this is the climax of the gospel. This is the heart. If you miss this part of the story, if you don't see Jesus properly here, then, then you, you miss everything. You can love him for his miracles. You can love him for his compassion, for his healings, all those things. But, if, but that'll never save you. If you don't see him, 
as a dying Savior, a perfect, holy, dying Savior because your sin and my sin is so horrific. Only he could fix that. Then you might as well just throw this whole book out. It's of no use to you. You've missed the whole point. So I want you to think about one of these four things as we reflect and we, we sing this song together. Where, where are you seeing Jesus improperly? One of them is, is maybe this way. Where do you wrongly think that you're okay and suffering Christians are not? You ever wonder why that? Why we pity all these suffering Christians? You know that suffering joyfully and willingly accepted is more honoring and more worshipful of God than any song you will ever sing to him. It shows his infinite worth when you're willing to give everything you have for him. Where do you think that that your life is so much better because you're not having to suffer like some others? That's a perspective change. Where do you feel like a victim? Where do you feel like a victim in your life? Because that reveals a wrong perspective of Jesus and who he is and should be in your life? Where have you conditioned your obedience on Jesus doing something for you? And lastly, where have you resisted Jesus' means of salvation and embraced the world's? So take just a few seconds and think, which one of those best describes me on this journey to the cross? And we're going to sing, and then we're going to come back. And I trust me, it's going to be a little more positive as we see what happens when I respond properly to Jesus. So don't leave. The best is yet to come. You can clap for that. So when I see Jesus properly, there's two things I want you to see in here that are so vital, so simple, yet so profound. When I see him properly, it it will transform you forever. So let me just read about this other, this last little character, kind of the protagonist, you might say, almost like the main character within the the greater story in this passage that, that, that highlights it just in this little nugget, but is what Luke wants us to see. says the other criminal protested. Don't you fear God? He's talking to the criminal that mocked Jesus on the other side. He's there saying, don't you even fear God when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes. But this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. See, when I see Jesus properly, there's two things that will happen in my life. The first is I'll live in reverence of his lordship. I'll live in reverence of his lordship. This criminal says, don't you even fear God? And and fear is not this like shuddering fear, but it's this reverence. It's this holy smokes. Like, this is God here. It's like if someone really famous walks into the room and everyone suddenly takes notice and goes, oh my goodness, did you see that? It was Mick Jagger. Right, if you know that, Rolling Stones played last night. That was just a little illusion, right? Like, you'd know. It was, like, it's a reverence. You see that? And he says at the end, you know, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He saw Jesus as a king. He saw him as one who ruled, who reigned. He had that position. And to fear God is to respect him, to reverence him. It, it does not glibly question everything he does or everything he allows. It just says, wow, you're God and I'm not. And that's a good thing. I mean, we've gotten so big for ourselves as a modern American Christians, we think we know so much about everything and, and stand in the place of judging God rather than just, just worship him, just trust him, know who he is, and just say, okay, God, it's your will, not mine. It's your world, not mine. And this guy did that. 
It's not bargaining with God to get what you ultimately want. It recognizes that He is what you want. Period. When you see Him like that, It changes you. In fact, just imagine, how how did this criminal even know that? He'd been a criminal his whole life. He'd never done anything good. And somehow in this journey, imagine, this is how I imagine it. The three of them are walking together. He probably, like Simon, saw everything that Jesus did on this journey. He would have heard what he said to these women. He would have saw, he saw Jesus say, forgive me. He would have seen everything that Jesus did. Now, now I don't want to just ask you something, but, but like you see these great preachers that are on TV and they look great and they're fantastic and whatever, but you always read about them like later you're saying, man, they got on an airplane and, and some didn't go their way and they were a total jerk. Right? You hear about these celebrities that are great on camera and in public, but man, you hear about them in private when they're put in a difficult situation, and they're total jerks. And that's humans in general. Be honest. But this guy is seeing Jesus after he's been mocked and beaten inches from death. He's been rejected by everyone. He's been said he's the king. He said he healed. He's done all this. He's seeing him when the heat is on as hot as it could ever get for any human being in the world. (laughs) And Jesus just oozes love. Like there's no one like him. And it was so powerful that this guy who lived a life of crime with his last breath said, Jesus, just remember me. Man, I I should be here. But someone like you, there's no way you did what these people said when I just saw you act like you did. The second thing we do, and he did, is we live in recognition of our sinfulness and his holiness. We live in recognition of our sinfulness and his holiness. The criminal said that. He said, he's done nothing wrong. We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Man, Luke wants you to put yourself on that cross next to Jesus, that person, and recognize we deserve to die. Say that with me. We deserve to die. That's what you and I deserve. And Jesus deserved to live. That's not what happened in the story. This is in vogue right now. In a day and age, it's all about self-love, self-confidence, self-esteem, me time. Right? I'm so glad Jesus didn't demand himself some me time while he was on that walk to the cross. Could you imagine? Well, hang on, guys. This is getting a little rough. This is a little tough on my mental health right now. I, I just need some me time. Can we just pause this right now? I'm going to, you know, take care of some things. Just want to be, look my best when I get up here. We love ourselves. The issue we don't have, if there's any issue we don't have as Americans, it's self-love. I'm just gonna say, it's crept into Christianity, we say, and I'm not saying that we have a horrible or wrong view of ourselves. It's like, if there's anything we do as humans naturally from the day we're born, it's love ourselves. The reason Jesus says, love your enemy as yourself is because he knows if there's anyone you love, it's yourself. So if you could just love your enemies the way you love yourself, it would be transformational. That's another message for another time. I probably insulted everyone at this point, but but if you just recognize your sinfulness and you need to put to death these desires for this broken world and present yourself to God as a living sacrifice. God, God, what do you want me to do today? Not, God, here's how you can help me with my agenda today. How different would it be if that was our perspective? Can I just make some simple observations about Jesus' life really quick? Like, we know he was the perfect human. The Bible tells us that without sin. He's the picture of holiness. He's our perfect example. Now, that doesn't mean when Jesus is our perfect example, it doesn't mean we do exactly what Jesus did. 
That's not what that means. He, he had a unique calling as Savior. But it does mean that our attitudes and our affections should be just like Jesus's. They should be the same as his. And then that will work itself out in the life that God has called each of us to, if that makes sense. But, but let me ask you this. Did Jesus demand to live in the best neighborhoods while he was here? Did he have to go to the best schools? I mean, I mean, he's God. Like, shouldn't he, he deserve the best education at the best institutions when he came? I mean, should he have demanded the best salary as a rabbi? I mean, who, who deserved better? Should he have worn the best clothes, enjoyed the best vacation? Or, or this one, I love this one. Should Jesus, like when Jesus went to synagogue, should he have demanded that his preferences were met when he showed up? Man, they better play the songs that I love. And if, if the temperature isn't where I want it and, and things aren't laid out, like, like should he have demanded that? Should he have demanded that everyone served him, that he could just whoosh in, sit down, and have someone hand him his coffee, give him a napkin, hand him something here, and, and just know that, hey, I come here and I expect people to serve me. Could Jesus have done that? Absolutely. Did he? The criminal on the cross has always been an admirable figure. He's probably the least talked about, but, but most people know about him, have heard about him. And he is admirable. In fact, I think most of us admire a person who can fully own up to their faults, don't we? Like, don't we find that admirable when someone just swallows and says, yeah, I, I did it. I'm a jerk. I, you own it. It's one of the, the healthiest and most admirable qualities in a person. But here's something that's interesting about it. When you are humble and when you finally get to that point after you've played all your games to try to avoid getting in trouble and you realize, all right, I guess I got to own up to it. Here's, here's part of our human bad motives is, is when we do admit, here's what we're hoping for. We're hoping that maybe our sentence will be slightly reduced when we do humble ourselves, don't we? Come on, raise your hand, admit it. I hope it's a little bit easier on me. If I just admit it, maybe they'll go a little bit easier on me. This guy certainly did that, right? He said, after he did it, hey, hey, Jesus, remember me in your kingdom. He did that. We all do that. We want mercy. We still call that humble, but we want mercy. But what would you call it if someone in their humility, in their humbling themselves, didn't expect a lesser penalty, but expected it to be infinitely greater. Meaning, maybe there's a conspiracy in your, in your office, in your whole department, and you're one little part of it, but there's hundreds, and you go, hey, if I humble myself, not only am I gonna be judged for what I did, I'm gonna take the punishment for everyone in my office. What would you think of the humility of that person? What if it went beyond their office to the whole stinking city, like every single broken sin in that city was now gonna be heaped on you if you admitted it? And what if you went past the city to your state or to your nation or to the whole world? Would you admire the humility of a man like that? Or would you fall on your knees and worship someone so willing, so loving, and so holy? The criminal on the cross was admirable for his humility. He's worthy of admiration. Jesus is worthy of worship for his. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, the story says it all. I mean, it's been right here in our laps for 2,000 years. At any moment, we can open up a book and see and read about the one event that's changed history, that's changed 
generations, it's changed people, it's changed nations. Everywhere it's spread. And yet, Lord, we can still push back against it. We can still find in ourselves the mockers, the mourners. And Lord, we need to become the criminals who recognize that we deserve death and you offer mercy. So Lord, I don't know where everyone is at here, but my prayer is that you're speaking to their hearts right now. That they recognize it's not them cleaning up their lives, it's not them figuring everything out, it's them seeing you properly. That that's the starting point for everyone. It's the starting point for this man. He never did one good deed for you. In fact, he's not the perfect example. He's just the foundation of how we get to spend eternity with you. It's, it's faith, it's trust that you did for us what we could never do for ourselves. But Lord, why would we want to wait till our final breath when we can begin eternity with you right now? So Lord, call your people. For your name's sake and for their good, Lord. Amen.